When picturing the most dangerous occupations, most people think of jobs like Evil Knievel's stunt double or a deckhand on the deadliest catch. Depending on your age, you might picture the lion tamer at the circus. I would bet that most of us get pretty far down the list before arriving at veterinarian or veterinary technician or most anything having to do with veterinary practice. But after the incredible events of 2020, I'm speaking of the pandemic here, it might not be so shocking to find out just how close to the proverbial cliff's edge many of us walk every day. Because this profession can kill you. Let's start with some data, shall we? According to research published in 2005 in the International Archives of Occupational Environmental Health, veterinarians and staff are estimated to file occupational health claims almost three times as often as human health care workers. And when only looking at severe accidents that resulted in a loss of work time greater than three days, the relative risk increased to almost 10 times as often as our human health care counterparts. 66% of those accidents reported by veterinarians and staff are due to scratches, bites, or kicks from animals. Now, I think that's pretty likely because while my Aunt Jill imagines all of my patients to be this, some of them are closer to this. And some of you may even see these. We're just talking accidents. We're not even talking diseases yet. Occupational disease claims are filed 2.7 times more often by veterinarians and their staff than by MDs. Occupational diseases filed most often concern the skin, followed by allergic respiratory diseases, and infectious diseases are almost 20%. In another article published in the Journal of the AVMA, among practitioners in Minnesota in 2012, nearly 30% had been infected with a zoonotic disease during their career. The list of documented zoonotic infections in veterinary professionals goes on and on, with some usual suspects, salmonella, Plague? MRSA? What? Q fever? And that's a list from a 2015 publication. Imagine what it might include if the same investigation were performed today, post-pandemic. How are veterinary personnel most often being exposed to these pathogens? Well, nearly 60% of exposures are via contact. Yeah, we're touching gross stuff. And I think we should all be a little bit alarmed that more than 20% of those are by oral transmission. Ugh. It does surprise me a little bit that most zoonotic infections are acquired by young veterinarians working in primary care practice. What? Young vets are supposed to be the smartest of us, right? I mean, they just left the ivory tower. Another fun fact for you, cats are most commonly reported as the source of a zoonotic infection. So what exactly are the most dangerous pathogens veterinarians face in practice? Let's focus on Chatfield's list of the top five most deadly zoonotic pathogens that we all face in practice. Number five, leptospirosis. It's sitting at number five with a mortality rate in people of 5.7%. Leptospirosis is a bacterial infection, typically producing clinical signs of liver or kidney failure in any one of the many mammals that are susceptible to infection. And almost all mammals are susceptible to infection. In practice, we most often diagnose leptospirosis in dogs, but it can cause disease in cats as well, it's just rare. In horses, lepto typically will manifest as an ocular disease, and it's called moon blindness. Lepto produces reproductive pathology in ruminants. Now again, most of us are going to encounter this bacteria in dogs and small animal practice, where it can present as a simple UTI or as severe liver or kidney failure. Transmission of lepto occurs through ingestion of contaminated food or more often water when wildlife such as raccoons, rodents, or feral hogs spread contaminated urine into puddles then the unsuspecting dog can become infected while on their daily walk. Have you ever seen a dog miss a puddle on a walk? No. We do know that the old-fashioned paradigm of the rural farm dog as the picture of high risk for lepto infection has shifted. And now dogs under 15 pounds that are urban dwellers and whose feet rarely seem to touch the ground, at least according to their owner, are at greatest risk. Fortunately, leptospirosis is a bacterial infection 
and thus treated with appropriate antibiotics and supportive care based on severity of symptoms and organ system affected. Now don't be stingy with the fluid therapy if you suspect a lepto infection. And in fact, in my practice, every sick pet needs a little fluid therapy. So don't be stingy about that, doc. All right, moving on to number four in our list of the top five most deadly pathogens in practice. Here, we will find several tick-borne diseases that combine for a mortality rate in people with a range of seven to 30%. Boy, I'd sure like to pick the 7% end of that spectrum every time I find a tick where it shouldn't be. Whew. Lyme disease, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, and a grab bag of rickettsial diseases make up this group of uncomfortable possibilities. All of these pathogens, with the exception of CCHF, require a tick bite for transmission. Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever can be transmitted via tick bite or through direct contact with blood from an infected mammal, like a goat. So CCHF really kind of diversifies its routes of transmission. But let's look briefly at each of these and how each most often presents clinically. Named for the geographic origin of the initial identification, Lyme, Connecticut, Lyme disease is caused by the bacteria Borrelia burgdorferi. In fact, speaking of states of the union, a small handful of states contain 95% of reported cases of Lyme disease in the US. These are helpful tips when you're planning your summer vacation. The ticks of interest for Lyme disease are Ixodes scapularis, the black-legged or dog deer tick, excuse me, and Ixodes pacificus, the western black leg tick in the west. Although other types of ticks, such as the Dermacenter variabilis, or the American dog tick, and some insects have been shown to carry Borrelia, to date, transmission of Lyme through those vectors has not yet been proven. So you still just wanna look out for those ticks. The longer a tick is attached, the greater the risk of disease transmission. And in fact, for Lyme disease, it can take 24 to 48 hours. Most dogs and cats are actually asymptomatic for Lyme disease despite infection. Those that do manifest clinical symptoms are almost always presented with the complaint of arthritis. Now moving on. CCHF is not a disease many Americans are familiar with, but it surely merits mentioning as it can be found in humans, birds, ticks, domestic animals, rodents, and mosquitoes. That is a very broad range. CCHF is a viral disease, narrow virus, and it's found in Eastern Europe, particularly in the former Soviet Union, all throughout the Mediterranean, in Northwestern China, Central Asia, Southern Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and the Indian subcontinent. So I don't know why we're not aware of it. It seems to be everywhere but America. So exoded ticks of the genus Hyaloma, including Amblyoma variegatum, Buophilus decoloratus, and Ripicephalus, are vectors for CCHF. And domestic animals, such as cattle, goats, sheep, hares, and hedgehogs serve as amplifying hosts for the Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. While many birds are resistant to infection with CCHF, ostrich are susceptible. Clinical presentation of CCHF in people begins with somewhat nonspecific symptoms, such as headaches, joint pain, etc. By the fourth day, the person has typically progressed to more advanced illness with uncontrolled bleeding as in other hemorrhagic fever infections. Clinical manifestation in animals is actually really, really uncommon. In fact, generally speaking, in he only humans and newborn mice succumb to infection with Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. I guess we're in good company with the newborn mice? Moving on to number three on my list of the top five most deadly, we get to MRSA. While it's true that methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or MRSA, does not typically colonize animals, it does have a 30% mortality rate in humans. And animals can have MRSA infections. Contact exposure is surely a possibility in practice. And if you recall, Contact exposure was one of the most common routes of transmission for zoonotic diseases to veterinarians. 
If MRSA doesn't routinely colonize animals, which basically means that animals are not routinely carriers of MRSA, then what methicillin-resistant bacteria does? Is there one? And why doesn't MRSA colonize animals? Well, okay, MRSA is actually a human host adapted gram-positive bacteria that can be found in the skin and nasal passages of people. It's why nowadays, if you go for surgery, they swab your nose before you have surgery to see if you're a carrier. Colonization rates of MRSA in cats and dogs normally ranges from about zero to 4%. However, MRSA colonization rates in specific populations can be higher, almost up to 10%. And it makes perfect sense that the primary risk factors for MRSA colonization in pets are contact with MRSA-infected people. Well, that's rocket science. But additionally, having been on repeated courses of antibiotics, going to a veterinary clinic, having surgery, or being hospitalized for several days are also risk factors that increase the possibility for MRSA colonization of an animal. Also, fun fact, veterinary personnel have a higher risk of MRSA colonization than the general population. Current studies actually demonstrate prevalence ranging from 4 to 18% in veterinary personnel, compared with just 1 to 3% in the general population. So, if I were you, I would really, really, really remember to wash my hands after touching that super disgusting, but so ugly they're cute pet. Staph sued intermedius is the pet's answer to MRSA. Staph sued intermedius is host adapted to dogs and cats and can be methicillin resistant. However, colonization of people by MRSP is typically only transient and human infections with MRSP is really, really rare. Okay, moving on to number two. Number two is a couple of parasites. Okay, you knew we were not gonna get through this without a couple of worms making the list. And it's a couple of doozies. So Bayless Ascaris procyonis and Toxoplasma gondii have a mortality rate of up to 40% in people. Boy, we are really getting up there with mortality rates, yikes. Bayless Ascaris procyonis, or Bayless to friends, is also called the raccoon roundworm. The raccoon is the only definitive host of Bayless Ascaris procyonis. And in some areas of the U.S., in fact, more than 90% of adult raccoons are infected. So to be safe, I assume all raccoons are infected everywhere. But I presume a lot of things about raccoons and infectious diseases. So Bayless is a roundworm, and the life cycle is pretty familiar to most of us. A couple of key facts to remember is that the eggs take two to four weeks to become infective once passed out by the raccoon. Thus, when one is presented a choice, always choose fresh raccoon feces. Also, remember that dogs have a habit of not just ingesting fecal material in the yard, but also rolling in it, or at least that's my dogs do. So the eggs of Bayless Ascaris are actually really quite sticky and can be stuck in a pet's fur when they come into the house at night to jump into the bed with you. Ugh. While dogs may become infected, I have not yet found any cases clearly documenting human exposure from a dog. I have come across cases documenting infection in kinkajous, but the kinkajous didn't transmit it to their people either. So it doesn't seem like the dog is a big source of concern, but I wouldn't want to risk it with something like Bayless. So now for Toxoplasma gondii. When I was growing up on the farm, I knew this parasite as the one that pregnant women get from cats. That was one of those facts of life that kind of ran along the same lines as, Every barn cat was gonna give me cat scratch fever, every dead animal with botulism, you know, these real facts that we all know. I wonder how many of you have facts like that you grew up with. Toxoplasmosis is considered to be a leading cause of death attributed to foodborne illness in the United States. Wow. I mean, we don't even talk about it much anymore. Well, that's not unreasonable because despite this incredible fact, Toxo is also considered a neglected parasitic disease in the U.S. So as a quick review, cats 
are the only definitive host for Toxo. Now it can be any cat. Could be a Maine Coon, could be a cheetah, but it doesn't matter. If you have Toxo, you must have had a cat there at some point. Another key thing to remember is that the oocysts that are shed in the cat's feces are unsporulated. And they're only shed for like one to three weeks by cats, but in huge numbers, hundreds of thousands. Then they take the one to five days to sporulate in the environment and become infective. Intermediate hosts include birds and rodents. Humans can become infected by many different routes, one of which is eating undercooked meat. Uh, there's a lot of reasons to cook your meat, Toxo to add Toxo to your list. Consuming food or water that's contaminated with cat feces. I usually try to avoid cat poop as a seasoning. Humans become infected via blood transfusion or organ transplant. And then of course the one we all know about, transplacental transmission from mother to a fetus. So in the human host, the parasites do form tissue cysts most commonly in skeletal muscle, myocardium, brain, and eyes. These cysts may remain throughout the life of the person. In the US, about 11% of the population that's over six years old have been infected with toxoplasmosis. Many people are infected because cats got in the garden and the produce wasn't properly rinsed or washed before they ate it. That sounds really disgusting, but it's a reason to keep your cats indoors. Number one on my list, coming in with a mortality rate of almost 60% in people is influenza. Okay, in fairness, it's avian influenza, but I tend to treat all influenzas the same because they all have the same origin, the dabbling ducks, as you see here in the center. They're the source of all flu, and all influenza is zoonotic. So you see lots of animals here who all circulate flu. I mean, marine mammals, who knew that they had an influenza that they circulated. I know you see pigs and horses on there, dogs and cats, but look at the crocodile. Yeah, influenza A has been shown to replicate efficiently in crocodilian eggs. That's a little scary. And then the bat. We always gotta have a bat if we're talking infectious disease. If anyone ever asks you a question at a dinner party, an infectious disease answer is always bats, PCR, or if multiple choice, the letter C. Small animal practitioners really uh, joined the front line in influenza emergence in the early 2000s when canine flu emerged. Very few creatures are unaffected by flu. But there's been no recorded cases of dog to human transmission of influenza. While we have seen cats transmit it to people, but it was really in a, in a close contact, high exposure environment. It was a shelter. So there's some key concepts that really put flu at the top. And that, those things are antigenic drift. That's the mutation that's very small. It's responsible for seasonal flu changes. And then you have antigenic reassortment or shift. That's a bigger change. And that mutation can produce pandemic infection because it can give it the ability to infect a new host species. So a flu can drift from season to season, then reassort to produce illness in a new species. And then finally, a random mutation in that recently reassorted virus while in a new host can produce a pandemic. Now let me tell you, a ton of bird species have been confirmed infected with influenza. So now that we have our top five most deadly zoonotic pathogens, how do we keep this profession from killing us? Well, I have some ideas. Most of these pathogens involve taking something disgusting and putting it in your mouth. So step one, close your mouth at work. That could be actually great advice in many situations. Just close your mouth or cover it up. Masks are all the rage these days. Also, wash your hands correctly and often. I frequently find myself thinking, when was the last time I washed my hands? You need to wash your hands appropriately in between every single exam and let your staff have time to do the same. Keep food where it should be and out of where it should not be. Have a break room, make a point to keep drinks and food in the food area not like this place. Use an appropriate disinfectant and use it appropriately. 
And by that I mean that contact time is a thing. And so read the label. Is it six minutes, 10 minutes, 30 seconds? Um, you need to make sure you know what the contact time is for the disinfectant that you choose to use in your practice. Additionally, you must first clean the organic material before you can disinfect a surface. So all of these things that we're talking about, you should have a plan for that. That's called, get ready for it, an infection control plan. Yeah, and all of you right now uh, at home, some of you are probably blushing thinking, oh my gosh, we don't have one of those, but you should get one. And it's not hard. I'm not suggesting you invent your own wheel or a better mousetrap. If you go to the website for the National Association of State and Public Health Veterinarians, they have a template there, doctor. And when I say template, what you should hear is editable Word document. All you have to do is download it and you can revise it. You can even slap your clinic logo on it. It's a really good template to use. And by the way, it's an infection control plan because we're not talking about biosecurity, even though that sounds a little bit sexier, that's not what we're talking about. Because biosecurity is what you need if you have no pathogens there and you want to keep them out. Infection control is what you use when you presume pathogens are already present, like in a clinic where sick animals come. Okay, so you're gonna get an infection control plan and you're gonna adhere to that infection control plan along with the staff that you work with so that you can keep yourself and your colleagues safe. And that is how we keep this profession from killing us. expressed on the site and by Dr. Jen the Vet are published for education and informational purposes only and are not intended as a diagnosis, treatment, or as a substitute for professional veterinary medical advice, diagnosis, and treatment. Welcome to another episode of Is This a Thing? Veterinary Translations for Pet Owners. I'm your host, Dr. Jen the Vet. And if you're a pet owner who's interested in learning more about vet med in order to better care for your pet, or just communicate with their vet, then please click subscribe and never miss an episode. Today, we're gonna to talk about one of my favorite topics. You all know I love infectious diseases, but I particularly like leptospirosis. Some of you may have heard of it. People call it lepto. It's a really interesting uh, pathogen. So let's get right to it. Leptospirosis is actually not new. It's been around and identified since the 1800s, if not sooner. And it has a lot of different names. Um, it used to be associated with the harvest. And in fact, it was called the wheelbarrow disease in old uh, German medical textbooks for people. Because lepto is a zoonotic disease, which means that not only can your dog get it, but so can you. It was called the wheelbarrow disease because the most common presenting symptom at that time was that during the harvest, the farmer would be out harvesting and he would become so ill that he would have to be carried back to the farmhouse in, you guessed it, a wheelbarrow. And so it was called the wheelbarrow disease. It was also called um, uh, autumn jaundice or harvest jaundice because it can affect the liver as well as the kidneys. You might know whenever your liver is diseased significantly, your skin and your eyes and stuff kind of get a yellow hue to them called jaundice. It is a bacteria and it lives well in warm, slow moving water, but it doesn't have to have just those specific conditions. And in fact, Lepto is considered ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Even if you live in the deserts of Arizona, leptospirosis is a threat for your dog. In fact, there's been a number of outbreaks there. Even if you don't live in the country, leptospirosis is a threat for your dog. So how is it getting everywhere? Well, there are different 
cerevars or strains of lepto, and each of them has adapted or evolved to maintain themselves in a specific host species. So for instance, there is a type of lepto called ectorohemorrhagiae. That's the only time I'm going to say it because we just call it ictero. And the maintenance host for that is rats, rodents. And what that means is that those rodents can become infected with the bacteria and they can shed it in their urine and they're not really sick. But if they become infected with another cerevar or type or strain of lepto, then they can become sick. They're considered the maintenance host for ictero. Canicola is the cerevar that dogs can be a maintenance host for. So there's all different, there's 250 different types of lepto. Not all of them cause disease in every creature. Right now in the United States, there are four cerevars that we know to cause disease in dogs. So I've told you it's a bacteria. I've told you that you get it from well, I didn't tell you. You get it from ingesting or eating contaminated water or food. If there's dirt on something. It's another reason to wash your vegetables. But your dogs get it because dogs never pass on a puddle. I've never seen a dog that passed up a puddle. If there has been a raccoon, a possum, a feral hog, another dog, gosh, almost anything that went through there and could have urinated in it or had urine contaminated hands or feet, then they've contaminated that puddle and then your dog lays in it, laps it up, gets it all over them, they're panting and it gets in their mouth, and now they have potentially have lepto. There's lots of different ways that lepto can show up. So let's talk about clinical signs in dogs. Clinical signs in dogs for lepto are pretty varied. It can present like a urinary tract infection. The dog could just be having accidents in the house very frequently. They could be drinking a lot of extra water. They could be vomiting. They could also have diarrhea. They could actually have conjunctivitis or inflammation in their eyes. I don't think that's super common. They may or may not have a fever. They may be anorexic or off their food, not really wanting to eat. Maybe they eat some candy, some treats, but they won't eat their regular food. Also, if you pick up your dog's lip and you look at their gums and their gums are yellow, you need to take them to the vet immediately. That can be from a number of different things, but lepto certainly should be on the list. Then you get to the vet. Are there, te can we test for it? Yeah, so let's talk about what your vet's gonna do. What are some diagnostics? Diagnostics for lepto could be blood test, could be urine test, it could be something that they have to send out, or it could be something they do right there. It depends. There's a couple different ways. We look for antibody titers to lepto. Now, if your pet has been vaccinated in the past for lepto, you need to let the veterinarian know that because they may be positive on some lepto testing if they've been vaccinated. They, we, they also, we can look for the leptobacteria itself. That's pretty tricky to find though, and so we don't always look for it. There's another way that we can look, which is PCR, polymerase chain reaction, where we usually look in urine for that, and we're looking for the, any little bit of genetic material from the bacteria itself in the urine, because lepto likes to set up shop in the kidneys and be excreted through the urine. That's how we test for it. But now, how are we gonna treat it? So let's talk about some things that your vet might use to treat your pet for lepto. Treatment for lepto is largely dependent on kind of the presenting clinical signs. So depending on how severe the illness is, if it's just a simple urinary tract infection that's caused by lepto, then your pet might get some subcutaneous fluids right then at the vet um, and be sent home on some antibiotics. It is important that you always finish the entire prescription of antibiotics. Most likely, your vet's going to want to test your dog again near the end of the antibiotics to make sure that it's okay to, to stop when you finish that prescription or to determine if we need to extend it. So it's important to finish it. That's if it's just a simple urinary tract infection. If your dog is more severe, severely ill, if they're not eating, if they're vomiting, then they may need to be hospitalized. If your vet runs blood work, which they likely are going to do, if your dog is vomiting, has diarrhea, isn't eating, and 
the kidney values are elevated, the BUN and creatinine, then they may recommend hospitalizing your pet for IV fluids. This is critical. This is probably the most critical piece of therapy for a dog in that situation. They're gonna put them on IV fluids and they're gonna start them on IV antibiotics. And then they're gonna retest their kidney values probably in 24 or 48 hours to make sure they're responding. The same goes true if the liver enzymes are elevated or if your dog is jaundiced, they're yellow, their gums are yellow or their eyes are yellow when you present them, they're going to wanna be aggressive then as well. If the liver is involved, the hepatic form of leptospirosis is very, very severe and very deadly to dogs. You can easily avoid all of this trouble if you get your dog vaccinated. So let's talk about preventing lepto. There's a vaccine for lepto. You don't have to worry about every puddle your dog steps in. All you have to do is get your dog vaccinated once a year for leptospirosis. On the internet, there's a lot of stuff that's said about lepto because it's true, you know, 20, 30 years ago when they first started producing lepto vaccines, there were lots of adverse reactions. And by that, I mean dogs with swollen faces, um, vomiting and diarrhea, etc. And so people didn't vaccinate very well for lepto because the owners didn't want to because they were afraid. The veterinarians didn't want to because they were afraid. It seemed like only big breed dogs that lived in rural areas were the ones that were vaccinated for lepto because they had a higher likelihood or a higher risk of illness from lepto. But now that has shifted. Now we know that it's actually little dogs that are less than 15 pounds and live in urban areas are more likely to be exposed to lepto. And that's because of the ictero cerevar from the rodents and the rats um, and some others, but really it's because of the rodent population that exists in some really intense urban areas, but also the rise of the urban raccoon. Raccoons are frequently implicated in lepto outbreaks. You want to make sure that you get your pet vaccinated. These days, lepto vaccines are very, very different. They're much safer. They're galaxies better than the ones that first hit the market 20 or 30 years ago. It is well worth it to vaccinate your dog. Every dog, Every dog is at risk for infection with lepto. I would wager every dog ought to be vaccinated for lepto. If you're afraid of the reaction rate, talk to your veterinarian. Tell them that you're concerned about that. There are things that we can do as veterinarians to mitigate or decrease the risk of an adverse reaction. The other thing is that these days, like I said, those vaccines are so much better. There's one lepto vaccine on the market that vaccinates for four serovars, which is the most you can have these days. And the adverse reaction rate to that vaccine is the same as it is for a distemper vaccination. And there's no one that's afraid of vaccinating for distemper because of adverse reactions, because that's really rare. So there's no reason you shouldn't talk to your vet and let them know that you're concerned about lepto, but you're also concerned about reactions and work through it. Because what you don't want to do is end up with a dog that needs dialysis because their kidneys are so severely impacted by a lepto infection because that's very expensive and it doesn't always work. So get your dog vaccinated. Lepto is zoonotic, so how are we going to keep from getting it? Let's talk about the zoonotic risk. Again, let's just revisit how does one become infected with lepto? Well, the same way that your dog does, by taking something disgusting and putting it in your mouth. And by that I mean, if you come into contact with an animal with lepto, don't drink their urine, right? It's, this is not rocket science. Don't get in nasty water. If you have cuts and scrapes, don't put those in dirty water that might be contaminated with lepto. Just don't do it. The other thing is you want to, if you have a pet that's diagnosed with lepto, you want to be very careful, especially with small children, only because I don't think they're going to drink dog urine. Of course I don't. But have you ever seen how a kid pets a dog with their mouth open, right? So you want to make sure that everyone in the house washes their hands frequently at that point in time and is very careful about what they do with the dog. The good news is that if your dog has lepto, we're fairly certain that after 48 hours of antibiotics, 
they're no longer shedding the lepto in their urine. However, you still should avoid drinking dog urine. Leptospirosis is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. Every dog is likely at risk. Talk to your veterinarian about what the common clinical signs might be and get your dog vaccinated. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode. I'm Dr. Jen Levette, and this has been Is This a Thing? Veterinary Translations for Pet Owners. If you're a pet owner interested in learning more about vet med in order to better care for your pet or communicate with their vet, then please click subscribe and you'll never miss an episode. Please remember, no YouTube video is a substitute for a visit to the vet. I'll see you all in the next episode. The opinions expressed on the site and by Dr. Jen the Vet are published for education and informational purposes only and are not intended as a diagnosis, treatment, or as a substitute for professional veterinary medical advice, diagnosis, and treatment.